This is Ray Harryhausen. These are some figments of his bold imagination. With these hands, this master craftsman gave unforgettable shape to figures drawn from those depths where the creatures of myth, legend, and dream reside in all of us. They have beguiled children for half a century, haunted their memories as grown-ups, and influenced generations of movie special effects artists. Today, Ray Harryhausen is, like his creations, a legendary figure. Fantasy is essentially a dream world, an imaginative world, and I don't think you want it quite real. You want an interpretation, and stop motion, to me, gives that added value of a dream world that you can't catch if you try to make it too real. And that's the essence of fantasy, isn't it? Transforming reality into uh, the imagination. The desire to create those transformations came to him early and suddenly. He was 13 years old when he was taken to see a sensational movie at Grauman's Chinese in his native Los Angeles. King Kong, that masterpiece of stop motion animation, instantly and permanently entered our collective consciousness and proposed his life's work to Ray Harryhausen. They had pictures of this big gorilla on top of the Empire State Building, so I got very curious and one day my aunt gave us these tickets and she went along with us and my mother and uh, I wa walked into Grauman's Chinese Theater and when I came out I haven't been the same since. The theatricality, the uh, showmanship, I just came out awestruck and I realized what you could do with animation. I mean it changed my life. He got busy immediately learning the rudiments of stop-motion animation by doing. He had a natural talent for the work, as these very early examples demonstrate. At first, his studio was the family garage. Later, his father built what they called his hobby house to accommodate Ray's expanding skills and vision. And that was really the start of my experimentation but uh, I owe everything to this giant gorilla and the people who made it. They were led by Willis O'Brien, a former newspaper cartoonist who'd been working in special effects since 1914. A school friend helped Ray meet him. I called Willis O'Brien and he was very courteous and he invited me over to the studio. So I loaded some of my dinosaurs that I had made into a suitcase, took them over to MGM, and he gave me some wonderful advice. He said, your Stegosaurus's legs look like sausages. You've got to learn to develop the muscles. O'Brien inspired him to enroll in art school, where he perfected his talents for drawing and sculpture, as these renderings he did for an unmade O'Brien project vividly demonstrate. When he was in art school, he also joined a science fiction club. At its weekly meetings, he made a lifelong friend. And lo and behold, there was a young writer struggling to get his stories published, was Ray Bradbury. And that was my first meeting with Ray Bradbury. He was crazy about uh, the, the lost world. He was crazy about King Kong, and I was similarly crazy. And we made a pact together, and we said, we're going to grow old but never grow up. We're going to stay 18 years, 19 years old and we're gonna love dinosaurs forever. When he heard that I was reconstructing them and trying to put a film together, of course we became quite good friends which lasted over the years. At the time, Ray was working on evolution. It was an attempt to tell the entire story of life's beginnings on Earth. And for a lone teenager, a hugely ambitious undertaking. Evolution was a 16-millimeter project, very ambitious when I look back at it, 
but in my naive way, I thought I could do it if I took a year or a year and a half. So I started making all of these experiments with it. And I'm very grateful I did, even though the picture was never completed because I got discouraged when I saw Fantasia. It covered the dinosaur sequence with Stravinsky's wonderful background music. And I thought, oh, they're covering the same ground and they did it so beautifully, I might as well abandon it. But it wasn't for naught. I used all this footage that I had experimented with earlier as a sample of what I could do. This woolly mammoth, created for evolution, is the earliest Ray Harryhausen model still in his possession. I made a few tests of it, but I never actually got to shoot it as a sequence and part of the film. But I did cut up my mother's fur coat, and uh, that was quite disturbing to some people. But I finally found out she didn't want it anymore, so I didn't get a whipping. His father, Fred, and his mother, Martha, supported his work unstintingly and frequently collaborated with him. The dog's name, perhaps inevitably, was Kong. Through the years, they became interested in what I was doing and they encouraged me enormously and it was most helpful particularly in the periods when one gets discouraged quite easily because you think you may be on the wrong track his mammoth got a role in another uncompleted film about an alien from jupiter a school friend played the monster's victim it brought him his first public recognition a feature story in Popular Science magazine, which ran this picture. Over the years, it gradually grew from just a hobby, which I did in my spare time, and it developed into a profession. My first uh, professional job, of course, was with George Powell's Puppetoons. I spent two years on the first 12 Puppetoons that he had made for Paramount. World War II interrupted his career, but not his professional development. He made this little film to demonstrate the instructional potential of stop-motion photography. He passed the war years in a Signal Corps unit, making such sequences for Army training films. One of his colleagues was Theodore Geisel, later better known as Dr. Seuss. He made this model of Geisel's snafu, a comically bungling soldier for a magazine cover. Army service also perfected his scrounging skills. The Navy had thrown out all their outdated Kodachrome and just threw it out on a, a junk pile. So I uh, retrieved it and had it stored away in my garage for quite a while. And when I came back from the Army, I, I didn't know quite how to use it up. So I thought, well, perhaps I could make some fairy tales for children. Mother Goose was up to date, technologically speaking, and Ray gave a hip flip to the four nursery rhymes he included in the first of what would become a short series of children's films. It took only two and a half minutes to tell the tale of the spider and the world's most famous arachnophobe. The other films in the series would devote their full 10 minutes to a single story. The first of them was Little Red Riding Hood. When I started making the fairy tales after the war, my father was very helpful. He had been an engineer in the early days, and he uh, made all the armatures for me from my designs for the puppet films. Armatures are puppet skeletons. They're wooden or metal bones connected by ball and socket joints. This allows the puppet to hold any pose for a one frame exposure, then be slightly changed for the next and the next. Linked together, these still shots, 24 per second, create the illusion of movement. Oh, grandmother, what large eyes you have. All the better to see you with, my dear, said the wolf. And then Red Riding Hood saw clearly his long, sharp teeth 
But Granny, what great sharp teeth you have. All the better to eat you with, my dear. And then, uh, fortunately, my mother had a uh, talent of uh, making little miniature costumes. So she dressed all the models of the puppets. So when you have a background like that, where you have a stage set for you in the house, and you have a carpenter who can build for you, and a mother who can sew for you, my God, you have a perfect situation. I wanted to make a simplified way of changing expressions on the figures, although I didn't want dialogue. If you have dialogue, you have to make a series of heads for each character using the vowels, A-E-I-O-U. So I felt that if I made 10 extreme heads from a neutral expression in the head, and then make 10 extreme different expressions, like with the eyes closed, with the mouth open, with the uh, mouth a broad grin, and these different extreme expressions, I could dissolve in eight frames from one head to the other. So if you register them carefully, the dissolve gives the impression that the face is flexible, like a rubber face. Hansel and Gretel was next. Originally, Ray had planned to include 10 or 15 titles in the series, but each new film was more technically sophisticated than the last. Rapunzel's hair, for instance, may have been an invitation to her prince, but it was a real challenge to the young animator. He found he was spending up to four months on each of these little films. If he were to do a long series, it would consume years of his life. Everything greedy King Midas touched turned to gold. Everything Ray touched turned to more time-consuming hours on a project with limited rewards. He decided to make just one more of the little films. The tortoise and the hare would have rounded his series off at an even half dozen, and Ray thinks it would have been the best of them all. But he completed only a couple of minutes worth of footage, seen here for the first time, when Ray received a call from Willis O'Brien, offering him the chance to work with his beloved mentor on a feature film. That was mighty Joe Young. He made this conceptual drawing for it in 1946, three years before it was released. In reality, of course, Mighty Joe was Teeny Joe. He was a little model about uh, 12 inches high. I helped Obi design him, and Marcel Delgado built the exterior. Ray estimates that he animated about 85% of Joe's sequences. More than anyone else, he was responsible for developing the character of a curious, gentle creature who didn't know his own strength. I felt the best way to do it was to give him one idiosyncrasy that every time he got angry, he would pound the ground with his fist. So I found myself in these first uh, scenes with a stopwatch and a canvas on the floor and I would go through the action so I could feel inside what it felt like. And I even went so far as to become a vegetarian slightly and eat celery and carrots for my tea break rather than the conventional biscuit and, and coffee. Like Kong before him, Joe was brought out of the wild to work in show business. The one-time heavyweight contender, Primo Canera, was the easily sunken anchor of the tug-of-war team. When you have a human, you have to try to keep in mind what a human would do in that situation. He had a fight with Primo Canera on the stage, and he finally had to pick him up and hold him over his head. So that required very careful animation and, and keeping in mind what a real person would do if under those circumstances. You can't just have them kicking. You have to give them the impression that they were actually lifted by this gigantic creature and do it in such a way that it's difficult to determine whether it's animated or live. This integration of stop motion and live action footage was an art Ray would spend the rest of his career bringing to ever higher levels of perfection. Ray and I both learned at a very early age not to listen to anyone else, to, to focus on your passion, to, to, to burn it with the, your glance, to become the dinosaur. 
The beast from 20,000 fathoms was also a beast from prehistory and from an old friend's imagination. Ray said, would you mind coming over and meeting my producer? The producer gave me a copy of the script they were working on and said, we need your help. Maybe you could help rewrite this for us. Would you mind reading it? So I went in the next room, read it, came out. They said, well, what do you think? Can you help us? I said, yes. But incidentally, this story of yours is very much like a short story of mine that was in the Saturday Evening Post two years ago, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Well, the producer's jaw dropped, and I realized they had taken my story, forgotten where they had taken it from, and called me in to rewrite it. So I didn't have to say anything. Uh, I didn't make a fuss. The next day, a telegram arrived saying we want to buy the rights to the beast from 20,000 Fathoms. And that's how the film got made. And I was walking along the shore one night and I came upon the ruins of the old Venice Pier and the serpentine spinal cord of the roller coaster. And I said to my wife, I wonder what that dinosaur is doing lying here on the beach. And the foghorn blew in the night, that following night, and I sat up in bed and I said, of course, the dinosaur on the beach, had heard the foghorn blowing, thought it was another dinosaur, I swam for an encounter, discovered it was a foghorn and a lighthouse and destroyed it and died. In the film, he had to live on for a few more reels. It was a short story, so there wasn't enough material for a complete feature. In the expanded screen story, the Redosaurus eventually makes his way to New York. Like most provincials, he didn't know how to behave properly in the big city. This is the film's most famous image. It closely duplicated one Ray first created for one of his boyhood experiments. The picture was also a surprise box office success and led to a meeting that would shape his future. There was a young producer who wanted to make a picture about an octopus tearing down the Golden Gate Bridge. So I thought, well, that's rather an interesting challenge. So um, I went over to the studio to meet him, and his name was Charles Schneer. What interested me was putting something on the screen that nobody else had on the screen, which was difficult to find. And I was interested in visuals and locations that had not been photographed, and I was also interested in leaving California to find those locations, because every rock, every tree within 50 miles of Los Angeles had been photographed. The Golden Gate Bridge was only 400 miles away, and it had been photographed aplenty, but not in quite the way they planned to do it in It Came From Beneath the Sea. We submitted the script to the San Francisco City Fathers, and they came back with the answer that they wouldn't cooperate because they were afraid that any destruction to the new bridge they had just built would suggest that it's not very substantial. So we had to, through devious means, I might say, we um, put a camera in the back of a bakery truck and drove back and forth so forth over the bridge to get the background plates. We were trying to do a very spectacular type of story with very little money. The budget was so low that I found that if I had an octopus, two less tentacles to animate would save some money on the special effects and time. Time is money, of course. So I cut off two tentacles and actually we had a sextopus. We kept them disguised underneath the water because nobody would count them, we didn't think. Ray's little secret was eventually betrayed in a magazine read by fantasy film fans. But it didn't spoil anyone's fun. I don't think there were any repercussions. I don't recall the city fathers banning the picture. And I'm sure that no one really worried about an octopus pulling down the Golden Gate Bridge. I seem to be a very a destructive person. I like to do things of a mass destruction. For example, this attack on the nation's capital by alien invaders. The year was 1956. 
Charles Schneer liked to take clippings out of the newspaper in the morning, and there was a big ado about flying saucers. So our next project became Earth versus the Flying Saucers. I went to Washington with a still camera and photographed all the locations I wanted, and then we sent a special cameraman to photograph the backgrounds based on my storyboard of photographs. And that was a challenge to work on because I had never used animation before for mechanical things like a spaceship. So I felt we could do things that you couldn't do ordinarily and took it on as a challenge. The thing about Ray's work that is so amazing is how bold he is. Look at Earth versus the Flying Saucers. You've got these flying saucers. And you've seen those in other movies, like Day the Earth Stood Still. And in that movie, they just sort of come and land, and, and they kind of like don't even want to show it. But Ray's movies, they're right there. He came up with great angles, great ideas, great dynamics that they could fly, and he was not afraid to show you the star of the movie. You had to have a certain amount of destruction, or you couldn't get the picture off the ground. So I ended up with the saucers crashing into the Capitol Dome and knocking over the Washington Monument. I'm glad to see they still stand today. Ideally, these scenes should have been shot by high-speed cameras, which create, paradoxically, ultra-slow motion images. These, in turn, give the illusion that light, tiny objects have the weight of large ones when they fall. But this was low-budget filmmaking. They couldn't afford the cameras. So I had to resort to animating all this destruction frame by frame. And I ended up, uh, when the Washington Monument was hit by a flying saucer, each piece of brick that fell out of the monument had to be on a separate wire. As the saucer plowed through the Washington Monument, cutting it in two. You can sense a person made it, that it's a person struggling with a medium to present themselves. That person was also struggling to leave Hollywood. Elementals was planned to be in Paris, where these creatures nestled in the Eiffel Tower. Because I wanted a trip to Europe, I got itchy feet. And the only way I could see to get to Europe was to make some location there, and then I would be sent for nothing, so, <laughs> and be paid for it. But it was never produced. They were humanoid bats. And Ray plays their victim in this test footage, all that survives of the project. If he was literally carried away by his idea, no one else was. But he would get his trip anyway, and soon enough make his permanent base in London. His deliverance was the Emir. Brought back from Venus by a space probe, he was originally supposed to land in Chicago. But 50s film economics supported Ray's wanderlust. 20 million miles to Earth was shot in Rome. I wanted a humanoid creature because having had experience with Mighty Joe Young, I felt you could do much more with a humanoid type of creature, although we didn't want to make it a man. He was taken out of his element and brought to Earth in a strange environment. When the creature hatches at the beginning and comes up and kind of rubs its eyes, and you just really feel an empathy for that guy. And that's true through all his films, that empathy for character. It's an actor. You're looking at an animated actor on the screen. So the Emir, we wanted to make him sympathetic. He was taken out of his element. Two things changed the Emir from a harmless little guy into a menace. The hostility of Earthlings as they confronted an alien figure and a curious addiction to sulfur. It accelerated his growth and perhaps exacerbated his temper. He wasn't really aggressive until the dog and the farmer became aggressive to him. And he finally got quite vicious because he was tortured and tormented by man. The poor boy was just a helpless soul out of his environment. And he finally ended up in Rome atop the Colosseum. Of course, that was influenced by Kong on top of the Empire State Building. Ah! 
I thought it would be a rather dramatic way of ending it. The film, man, of course, destroys what he doesn't understand. I've been responsible for destroying New York, San Francisco, and Washington. And we kind of got tired out of uh, doing these destructive pictures constantly, which were popular in the 50s. So we took the path of action, we took the path of suspense, we took the path of imagination. That path was illuminated by drawings Ray had made some years earlier to illustrate his ideas for a movie about the adventures of Sinbad, a legendary Arabian sailor. The origin of the seventh voyage came a few years after Mighty Joe. I wanted to find a new outlet, and I developed these eight big sketches based on the adventures of Sinbad. I felt he was a personification of adventure. When I saw those drawings, I was absolutely overwhelmed by them. And uh, I didn't need any more than those drawings to sell it to the distributor. And that was our first color picture. It was also Ray's first experiment with his signature creation, the living skeleton. The skeleton was really the inspiration of uh, going to Sinbad when I first started making my drawings. And in Sakura's castle, I think it came off as a possibility because he could animate inanimate objects through his black magic. The seventh voyage of Sinbad starred Kerwin Matthews and Catherine Grant. But it was Ray's stop-motion artistry that made it one of the surprise hits of 1958. And, in its influence on the next generation of special effects people, one of the more significant movies of its time. For me, there's nothing like being trapped in a cave with one skeleton. Because in this cave in Sinbad, you can't get away. Matthews, playing Sinbad, was, in Ray's words, a master at maintaining the illusion that he was actually dueling with an imaginary creature. In reality, the skeleton was not tricked into the film until months after principal photography was completed. I was about five years old, and at its first theatrical release, I saw Seventh Voyage of Sinbad with my mom, it had a very profound effect on me. I saw it eight times the first week it came out. And I had, which is very hard when you're like 12 years old, and you have to find friends and relatives or neighbors that'll drive by the movie theater to drop you off so you can see the movie over and over again. Uh, it was just something about that Cyclops standing on the beach, the, the kind of orange skin and the blue sky and, and the spectacle of it that I had never seen in any other film. Many years, I even had dreams about the Cyclops growing in the family fish tank, living there, but always on the verge of bursting out and coming after me. In classical mythology, you find the Cyclops quite often, but never the size we made him. We tried to give him a proportion so that people would find him rather awesome and I think he worked out quite well, particularly when he had an encounter with the dragon. Just as Ray had looked to Willis O'Brien as a mentor, young craftsmen would soon be looking to him in the same way. Dennis Murin, who has gone on to win eight Oscars among them. It was a wonderful experience. I'll never forget those times going out to visit him. You know, and one time I was looking around his, his garage and up in the rafters of the garage, there, there were, well, something was sticking out that was like a wooden skull of something going behind some boxes. I couldn't see what it was, and it was all in pieces, and it was the dragon from the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. And I just thought, oh, what a sad end for such a wonderful creature. There was almost a note of irony. I mean, I thought the Cyclops, I liked him. I didn't like getting beaten by the dragon, which was more ruthless. I absolutely believed in the reality of the worlds he created, the marriage of the live and stop motion. Ray's dreams ranged far and wide. As a youth, he had wanted to retell the David and Goliath story. He went so far as to make this test footage for a Baron Munchausen film. 
he loved vast contrasts in scale. They could be charming as well as terrifying. As he proved in The Three Worlds of Gulliver, since he and Schneer couldn't afford major movie stars, these figures, stars in the world's collective consciousness, stood in for them very successfully. We needed material that the public had recognized, characters that had been around for a very long time. And I remember reading that the book most looked at in American public libraries at that time was Jules Verne's A Mysterious Island. And we made that picture. Like most of Ray's films, it was the story of an heroic voyage. In this case, in an exotic and fragile vehicle. We kept the original escape during the Civil War with this balloon because we felt that would make a very exciting opening for the picture. And Bernard Herrmann's music has always struck me for that sequence as most dynamic. Actually, the story that we received was how to survive on a desert island, which was basically Jules Verne's original concept. But we felt we could improve it by, uh, and make it much more interesting than just survival type of picture, by incorporating some strange creatures in it. They were all oversized, therefore more dangerous versions of otherwise ordinary animals. Eventually, we and the castaways learn they are being bred for giganticism by Verne's visionary Captain Nemo, who hopes they will feed an overpopulated world. Actually, we found this crab in Herod's fish department, believe it or not, and we didn't want to boil it because it would turn it bright red. So it was necessary to turn it over to a lady in the museum who uh, uh, destroyed it in a humane way and uh, then gave me the sections in which I had to build a proper armature for stop-motion photography. When we were shooting the ultra close-ups of the crab's little area in the mouth here, in which it operates many different levers and hairs that vibrate, uh, we got four more live crabs. They were called edible crabs. Uh, we had a delightful meal after they served their purpose. The most spectacular of these creatures was this really big bird. Most people thought of it as an imaginative variation on some sort of domesticated fowl. Bernard Herman, who did the music, realized that. And when we were looking at the picture, I remember him saying, Ray, I'm going to use turkey in the straw for this sequence. And I thought, oh my God, no, but he was pulling my leg, of course. For Ohakis in the sand would be more like it. Ray had modeled this creature on the prehistoric bird. Nothing funny about a giant bee. It's all too easy to imagine what his sting would feel like. He also had plenty of bare flesh for a target. Get in the honeycomb. We had a sequence where the bee sealed them in the honeycomb. And that sequence was rather interesting because it had to be shot backwards so that I gradually destroyed and had the bee open up the honeycomb. And then, of course, when it was run backwards, it looked like he closed the honeycomb. Seal was in. Another of Ray's long-cherished dreams was to make H.G. Wells the War of the Worlds. This magnificent group of conceptual drawings suggests he would have taken a witty approach to one of science fiction's basic texts. This model of one of the aliens who invaded Earth 
implies a certain sympathy for these creatures. So does the test footage he made. It is of the story's ironic climax, showing the fearsome man from Mars succumbing to an ordinary earthly illness from which he has no immunity. Ray finally got to do a Wells story, First Men in the Moon. There was no attempt to update Wells. The space capsule, all the film's technology, was quaintly Victorian, just as Wells might have envisioned it when he wrote in 1900. The moon's inhabitants were designed to follow Wells' descriptions very closely. H.G. Wells did suggest that perhaps the Ant-Men grew intelligence far in advance to the human race on Earth. So we wanted that element, and I designed the moon creatures as ants, intelligent ants. He also described the creatures that the ants lived off of. They raised these creatures like we would raise cattle for food. That's a cow. I wouldn't like to meet a bull. Come on, Kevin! Dr. Caver, the expedition's leader, was played by Lionel Jeffries. The moon men study the stranger in a kind of super X-ray machine. Ray's pre-production sketches didn't imagine Jeffries, but like the film itself, the actor caught the adventurous idealism of a more innocent age. Man, man, we come from Earth, many hundreds of thousands of miles away. No, no, it doesn't mean a thing, nothing at all. Man. Yes! Man! Do you hear that? They're, they're trying to communicate with us. Why, that's imperial! It's absolutely pit! Man! Man! From hundreds and thousands of miles away! Man! From Earth! That's splendid! It's splendid! It's absolutely imperial. Yes! Oh, my dear fellow, it is! It's absolutely imperial! I've seen some of the fantasy films before, but none of them sort of had the the sort of awe that the Ray Harryhausen movies had because of the fact that they're characters, there are synthetic characters that are alive, that are moving around in the sets with you, and that are affecting real people that are obviously can't possibly be real. I think we both favor Jason the Argonauts as our favorite picture. I think it was the best picture we did. I think it's a highly imaginative sequences. When you talk about a seven-headed hydra, when you talk about skeletons rising out of the ground, these are memories that you don't really forget. They're totally memorable, and they don't remind you of any visual thing that you've seen. This monstrous figure was only the beginning of the film's wonders. Chaos. In the original story of Jason and the Golden Fleece, there was a character in it called Talos, although he was not as large as we depicted him in the picture. He was only eight feet high. But when I started the design process for the sequence, I felt we could get much more menace if he could be about the size of the Colossus of Rhodes. And this became a great opportunity to combine the concept of the Colossus of Rhodes with the Metal Man. And I had to make his movements very stiff and ungainly because he was supposed to be made of metal. So we put the sound effects of creaking joints and creaking metallic sounds scraping together to give that eerie effect. Spectacular as he was, Talos was fairly simple to create, compared, say, to the Hydra who guards the Golden Fleece. Easy to imagine a seven-headed monster fiendishly difficult to animate him. Todd Armstrong, playing Jason, had the easy job. He only had to slay the monster. 
Ray had to bring it to persuasive life. All those heads in constant, simultaneous, menacing motion. There were many times when I regretted even thinking of the Hydra for the film. He presented so many animation problems that I didn't anticipate. Number one, if the telephone rang and I was in the midst of animation, I would forget sometimes whether this head was going forward or backwards and this head going up or down and the various other problems with the other heads it became quite confusing. Ray always worked alone without assistance. Since there's more to seamless animation than perfect movement, he would often stay overnight in his studio to make sure the temperature of his lights remained constant. If it varied, the colors in his work wouldn't match that of the live action footage. Ray's masterpiece and most famous sequence, the mass rising of the dead in Jason. In its complexity, it had no precedence in his work or anyone else's. Those who steal the golden fleece must die. Skeletons are, are really my best friends. So seven of them was quite a challenge and I hesitated developing that idea because what I put on paper has to be put on the screen. That's one of the sales gimmicks. So I try not to draw anything I can't possibly do. Kill! Kill, kill, kill them all! have five appendages on each skeleton. So that means seven times five is 35. You have to make 35 moves when you have seven skeletons on the screen for one frame of film. And that meant at certain periods when we had all seven skeletons in the same scene with the three men, I was only able to average about 13 frames a day. That's a little over a half second of film. Ray worked on this sequence four and a half months. Before that, its live action elements required meticulous planning. This still shows stuntmen helping the actors rehearse. When the players had their movements perfectly memorized, the stuntmen stepped out of the picture and the actors shadow boxed opponents they would not see until the film was finished. One million years BC took Ray back to a far more distant past and to his own beginnings as a boy whose imagination was fired by the drama and adventure of prehistoric times. Ray's actors, these models which now reside in a Berlin museum, were as anatomically correct as his study of paleontology could make them. Because this was a fantasy film, he felt free to bring together creatures that had lived in different geological eras. That included human beings who did not share the earth with dinosaurs or pterodactyls. Miss Raquel Welch had to be picked up by an animated pterodactyl. That made it necessary that we construct a small model of Miss Welch so that she was able to be animated at the same time as a pterodactyl. We dug a large hole in the sand and at a certain point Miss Welch would throw herself into the hole. The miniature Miss Welch would be substituted. The animated character would pick up the miniature Miss Welch and carry her off into the skies. Mixing and matching figures from different ages was a delightful Harryhausen specialty. In the Valley of Guanji, cowboys encounter prehistoric creatures in the remoter reaches of Mexico, circa 1900. The Valley of Guanji was actually a product that Willis O'Brien originated and was working on for about a year. It had all the elements. It had the dinosaur, which was very popular. It had the cowboys. Cowboy pictures at that time were very popular. So we felt if we could combine these two elements that we would have a good chance of success. 
This sequence had been a particular favorite of O'Brien's when he conceived the film in 1942. I wanted that sequence to be kept in more than anything else, but the one problem technically was that we had to have something for the cowboys to rope. So we put a pole on a jeep, and the cowboys would throw their lasso over the pole, and then I would eliminate the jeep and substitute Guanji. And then, of course, each frame of film, you had to animate a miniature wire going over Guanji's head and still have it connected to the source. Give him time! Ray also loved to bring together mythological figures from widely disparate cultures. The Golden Voyage of Sinbad and Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger are his freest explorations of these possibilities. Even though in the Muslim world they would never have a figurehead on a boat, we took that liberty to have Sinbad have a figurehead aboard his boat and gave Sinbad an encounter with a very unusual element. They became golden voyages through the myths of the world. The griffin and the centaur both come from legend and mythology. The griffin is of possibly Norse origin. The centaur comes from Greece and may go as far back as ancient Indian mythology. They had originally planned to shoot Voyage in India, hence Kali. She stayed in the picture, even though it was eventually made in Spain. In order to rehearse all the six arms with the actors who were playing the part, we had to strap three stuntmen together with a big belt. It was rather a grotesque sight on the set, I must say. She was many hands full of trouble for John Philip Law playing Sinbad. Trog, short for troglodyte, was a sort of missing link and the most touching figure in Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. No harm. We mean no harm. Gentled by love, Trog would eventually defend his new human friends from a remarkable nemesis. Sabretooth I'd never seen it in a film before, so I thought we could make use of it. A cat is always more difficult to do than other types of animals. They have such slow-moving feline postures that it makes it very difficult to animate it in that way. <laughs> For all his ferocity, the tiger required very delicate handling. If in touching him, Ray ruffled his fur in the wrong way, the camera would see it. It's a masterpiece of Ray's maturity. Yet, like all his work, it speaks of, and to, a child's sense of adventure. There's a certain childlike quality I think one has to maintain uh, for the love of a fairy tale, for the love of uh, fantasy. Nothing reflected that love more memorably than Ray's Pegasus, created for his last film, The Clash of the Titans. As he did for all his characters, Ray drew hundreds of storyboard sketches, pre-planning Pegasus's screen life in infinite detail. But that was only part of the creative process. In most films that I'd seen in earlier times about Greek mythology, they always pictured Pegasus with very small wings, and you were never quite convinced that they could lift him off the ground. And I found it a challenge to try to make a convincing looking flying image that would give you the illusion that the horse could be actually lifted into the air. When Perseus tried to break him in, of course, he was supposed to be a wild horse. So I felt that we could get away with having a bucking bronco effect when Perseus first jumps on his back and takes him off into the air. The, what would the horse do except try to get rid of him?
Titans is, of course, based on a story drawn from Greek mythology. Trying to win the hand of his beloved Andromeda, Perseus is presented with many obstacles far more formidable than taming this wild, ultimately devoted steed. None was more frightening than his encounter with Medusa. Rey virtually reinvented this evil goddess, departing completely from the way artists through the centuries had portrayed her. The scene with the Medusa in the labyrinth is absolutely incredible. I think it's the finest piece of work he ever did. And it's a masterwork of lighting, of animation, and of drama. Adding to the challenge, Ray lit the scene by flickering fires, an enormously difficult illusion to sustain in stop motion. Medusa was a very interesting character to work with, although very complicated to animate. For each frame of film, which is 1 24th of a second, you had to move 12 snakes in her hair, the heads and the tails of each snake. Then you had to move the hand. Then you had to move the arm. You had to keep the body in synchronization with the rest of the torso, with the tail, with the rattle. I didn't want to make just a normal woman with snakes in her hair. That wouldn't turn anyone into stone. So I felt we had to make her as ugly as possible and have this power in her eyes to turn people to stone. We gave her a serpentine quality and evil look so that she would be more of a menace than just a pretty face with snakes in her hair. Then we could get wonderful effects. We could get the rattle in her tail as a sound effect of threat. The Greeks always thought their gods were the same as the human beings. They had the same foibles, the same uh, uh, misgivings that the human would have. Uh, but they were just larger people living on Mount Olympus. The gods, presided over by Laurence Olivier Zeus, manipulated, toyed with the fates of humankind, sometimes mischievously, sometimes malignly, as in the case of the rebellious Calabos. He will become abhorrent to human sight. He'll be shunned and forced to live as an outcast in the swamps and marshes. He'll be transformed to a mortal mockery, a shameful mark of his vile cruelty. In a way, what the gods did is not so different from what Ray has done all his life, controlling the lives and destinies of his subjects. I don't think there's any special, strange quality that made me want to have a god complex. But when you look at it, you say, here you're putting on the screen images that uh, appear to be alive, and you're controlling exactly what they do. And that's why this concept in Greek mythology uh, appealed to me so much, uh, that the gods were manipulating humanity. What we all want is power. We, we, as boys and as young men and as men, want to control the world as best we can. One of the ways to do it is by writing short stories where you run the characters through their, their roles and you destroy them or build them. And the other way is doing what Ray has done. It might be that you've got control of this. You know, you can, you can build it, you can tell the story, you can photograph it, you can then display it the way you meant it to be seen. That's a really interesting idea. I think in the end the reverse is true, that um, we tend to serve the puppets and not the other way around. Godlike or not, Ray Harryhausen is revered, as the Motion Picture Academy proved in 1992. One of the greatest moments in my life was when Ray Harryhausen got his Oscar from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. When it was time to present the award I called the Academy, I said, I've got to be the one to hand him his Oscar. It's another fine mess you've got us in, Ray. <laughs> it's, it's rare in the history of motion pictures or any other art form. The two young men meet and promise themselves a lifelong friendship, plus an enduring love for dinosaurs. <laughs> how to bring them to life, how to put them on the screen. And in 1938, just out of high school, Ray Harryhausen came into my life. Good Lord, what a friend to have. Someone just as crazy as I was, 
about primeval monsters and how to get them into theaters and keep them there forever. So Ray Harryhausen, lifelong dear friend, uh, with all my love and all my heart, come get your reward. So the night of the awards, I was out on stage. I brought him his Oscar, we embraced, and I, I cried <laughs> like crazy because I felt it was my Oscar too. It was a, an award for all the years of love and patience and paying attention to one another. Oh my God. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Thank you. Thank you so very much. It's most appreciated. Some people say Casablanca or Citizen Kane. I say Jason and the Argonauts is the greatest film ever made. In an age of computerized animation, Ray Harryhausen's work reminds us of the human hand's value. At a time when vast teams create special effects sequences, his work reminds us of what the committed individual can accomplish on his own. In this moment of the mechanized imagination, this unforgettable work recalls for us the value of the open and wondering eye, the informed and compassionate heart.